Well, you can't say the Bible's boring. <laughs> That's quite a story here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 9. Um, we've got, I mean, it's better than any uh, adventure book you could read. It's better than anything um, they could put on the screen here. I mean, there's uh, action, adventure, treachery, you name it. Uh, especially, this is a great story in the Bible. There's a lot to learn here. I'm going to ask you to keep your place in 2 Kings chapter 9. We're going to come back to this story um, about mid-sermon, but and then I'll apply it to um, what we're talking about. But this morning, let me just tell you what the topic of this morning's sermon is. And hopefully, you know, this sermon doesn't apply to you directly this morning. But, uh, you know, there's this mainstream thinking today on this topic um, this morning that I want to preach about. I want to preach a sermon this morning on the idea or the topic of marijuana this morning. And it's, it's super irritating to me, this, this topic, because it is becoming very mainstream today. It's, become, it's been happening for, I would say, in my life for about 15 years, maybe you could say 20 years, that this has just been getting more and more people are playing down the dangers of this and, you know, just the consequences of marijuana. Um, over the last few years, and it's just getting really part of the culture today, um, which is really irritating. I want to preach on it. I want to talk about um, what the Bible says. I want to talk about actually um, that it is not something we should have um, in our car culture. You know, the culture today is teaching that marijuana is harmless. Marijuana is, um, I remember maybe 15 years ago, there was this idea that started being um, pressed that, you know, marijuana was actually better for you than alcohol and all these different things, it's natural, you know, versus, you know, alcoholic things. And, you know, the thing is, you know, then it, you know, started in, you know, 15, 20 years ago about being a, a good medicine, right? It's a medicine that people can use. So that, again, pushed this culture of, you know, marijuana being this harmless thing that actually it can be good at, at times. And I want to show you that that's completely false this morning. In Genesis, actually, turn to Genesis chapter 1. I've actually heard the Bible used to justify marijuana. I've actually heard people, you know, people that don't know the Bible, you know, try to misquote a verse or two, mainly this one, um, about uh, marijuana and use this for marijuana. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 29, the Bible says, And God said, in verse 29, Behold, I give you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Meaning, you know, you're going to eat it, right? First of all, like, and then people are like, see, marijuana. You, you know, and you're just like, what are you talking about? First of all, this is before the fall, you know, where people just did, you know, this was before the fall, before there was like, you know, before creation was cursed. Right? I mean, I don't think that in the Garden of Eden there's poison oak. All right? I mean, they're, they're, that's not the Garden of Eden that I, I read about in the Bible. But, you know, that doesn't mean, I mean, you think about after the fall and creation was cursed. You know, this certainly doesn't mean you should go out and eat every mushroom and every opium plant and every poisonous. If you eat poison oak, you'll die. You know, it would probably kill you if you eat poison oak. It's so bad chemically that, you know, but so it's just, it's just stupid and and wrong to apply this pre-fall, you know, verse to that you can just go and smoke weed. I mean, it makes no sense at all. So, you know, somebody in my family asked me this week when I told them I was going to preach on marijuana, they said, well, how is, how is the sermon on marijuana going to be different than like an alcohol sermon? And I'm going to show you that it's going to be very different. Um, I said, you just have to wait and see. But it's going to be very different this morning. But first of all, I'm going to give you three points this morning on, you know, marijuana and how the Bible says that we should not be anywhere near this and the, the dangers and the effects of it, it is not harmless. Okay, it is not harmless. It is much worse than alcohol, in, in my opinion. And, you know, I think the Bible will show us that as well. But, first of all, it does have some application um, to alcohol. The Bible doesn't mention marijuana. The Bible doesn't mention, you know, even drugs. You know, the Bible does say that you should be sober, though. And this is what the parallel with alcohol is. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. So the, the first point is a simple one, and it is the exact same point of, you know, um, why no Christian should drink alcohol, is that the Bible says that you should be sober. So yeah, the Bible has different types of wine. There's non-alcoholic wine. Sometimes it's talking about strong drink, you know, wine that does have alcohol in it. And the Bible is very clear that no Christian should be anywhere near strong drink or alcoholic beverages. 
But the Bible, moreover, the Bible clearly teaches that we should not be drunk, that we should be sober, clear-minded, not under the effect of some chemical, you know, controlling our brains. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 7. 1 Peter 4, verse number 7. This is the simplest point. Then we're going to get into the, the very specific points with marijuana this morning. But the first one is just the Bible is very clear in saying, you know, be sober. And these are, I mean, I, we could read dozens of verses talking about this. I'm just going to give you a couple. Look at verse 7. It says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now go to Galatians chapter 5. So inevitably people say, yeah, when the Bible says be sober, it's just saying be serious. You know, it's not talking about, you know, not being drunk. So let me just prove that wrong for you. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 21. Galatians chapter 5, look at verse number 21. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 verse 21, it's talking about these pretty serious sins here. It says envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. So the Bible is clearly teaching against drunkenness. And the opposite of drunkenness is sobriety, is being sober, being completely without you know, the influence of something on your brain. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse number 11. So now I want to point out something in the case of sobriety, how alcohol is actually not as bad as marijuana. Look, alcohol is bad. Christians should not drink alcohol. I'm not going to reprint, re-preach um, that sermon. But the point is, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11 is talking about six things that are so bad they will literally get you kicked out of church. Now, no church follows this today except this one. Because, I mean, you say, well, you've done it. Yes, we've done this here. People have been not allowed to come back to this church because of one of these six things. Okay? Any of these six things. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says this. But now I've written unto you not to keep company... That means they can't come to church, these people. That's what that's saying. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, know not to eat. So the Bible, Paul is explaining to the church at Corinthians that at Corinth that these things cannot be allowed in the church. The whole context of the chapter was somebody that literally got kicked out, put out of the church, because he was in fornication. And the Bible is saying, you can't have, Paul is teaching, you know, the administration of the church here, saying, you can't have these things in the church because they will spread to everybody else in the church. And the only way for those, these people to get right is to be put away, put out from, you know, their brethren. And the idea is that they would get better, that they would get that sin out of their life, and then they would be brought back. That's 2 Corinthians right there. They would be brought back into fellowship in the church. But notice a couple things here. First of all, it says any man that is called a brother. So any man that is called a brother, meaning it's not like a first time visitor is going to come in here like with his girlfriend and, you know, say, you know, he's, he's, you know, hi, how did you find out about the church? He shakes my hand after the church service and he's like, oh, my girlfriend and I, you know, um, we live together and, and, you know, he kind of, you know, says they're in fornication, which is completely normal today for the world. And it's not like we pick them up by the belt straps and chuck them out the front door like their first time service, all right? Any man that's called a brother, meaning anybody that is, you know, getting involved in the church, that is becoming a regular, you know, to the church. And, it, you know, that's kind of my, I draw that line. You don't have to draw that line. I draw that line. And that line will be drawn. And these are not comfortable conversations to have. These are not things that no, any pastor enjoys doing, but these are things that if we're going to have a biblical church, must be done. They must be followed. Or you endanger the other people, especially the children of the church. I mean, I can stand up here and preach about drunkenness and, you know, fornication and covetousness, and then we have all this in the church, and, like, it's just going to be, the preaching would be a joke. That's why, you know, we cannot be hypocritical you know, with the church. That's what Paul is teaching here. But here's the difference between marijuana and drunkenness. The Bible doesn't say, the Bible says someone that is a drunkard here. So somebody, look, I don't think you should ever drink alcohol, but somebody that, and this is a rare person in my experience in life, but somebody that goes home on Friday night and has a beer after work one time and has one drink after work is not a drunkard by any measure, okay? And look, that's a rare person in, in, in my life experience, 
but you can be someone that occasionally has an alcoholic beverage and not be a drunkard. The difference between marijuana and alcohol is every single time you do it, you get drunk or get high with marijuana. So there will be no person in this church that is a user of marijuana, as far as I am concerned. You know, so that is a, it's a different measuring stick because of the nature of, you know, that, that drug, really, right? So somebody that is an occasional user of marijuana, they're only doing it to get high. And I believe most people that drink alcohol are only doing it to get drunk, don't get me wrong, but there is a different severity there in, in the case of marijuana or any drug, by the way. So the first one is the Bible clearly teaches be sober. All right, so the Bible clearly teaches that. So we could just pray and just, you know, start fellowshipping right away as far as the Bible is concerned. But we'll keep going, um, and I want to show you some things where marijuana from the Bible, especially, marijuana is actually much worse than alcohol. Okay, Can we, we kind of see the one with alcohol and, and you know, the, just the, the level of sobriety there is already more severe. But turn to Proverbs chapter 20. So the first point is a simple one. It's the same point as why, you know, one of the reasons you should never drink alcohol is because the Bible says be sober. But turn to Proverbs chapter 20. The second point is this. The second point is this. So, so I'm going to kind of give you some, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some bombastic statements here in the, the second and third point, but I'm going to back it up with research and what the Bible actually says. The second point of why no one should be anywhere near marijuana is because it makes you an idiot. It turns you into a, well, what the Bible would say, if we're going to use Bible language, it turns you into a fool. Turn to Proverbs chapter 20 and look at verse number 1. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number one. We'll apply a, a, a drink or a, 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 a drinking alcohol, you know, application here. But the Bible says this. It says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So the Bible is saying here, I'm just trying to prove the point to you right away from the Bible that you can make decisions in your life that will make you more wise or less wise. So you can literally do things that make you a fool. The Bible is clearly teaching here alcohol being one of those things. But what if this has a dual meaning? What if this has a dual meaning where it literally, you know, what if this means that being not sober can literally make you st stupid? I mean, that's another application uh, of this verse right here, is that being not sober, not being sober, can literally make you dumb. What if that's true? Now let's look at some research from marijuana here. First of all, Oh, they're going to use IQ as, as a test here um, in all these scientific tests. So what is IQ? IQ is, it stands for intelligence quotient. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically a, a benchmark or a test on how, uh, what your cognitive abilities are, I guess is, is a good way of saying it. They measure, it's a measure of intelligence that's commonly used in scientific studies. So it's going to be mentioned in the studies that I show you here. Now, I have a mixed opinion about the... Um, the, the actual mainstream idea of IQ, and I'll tell you what my um, opinion is and where it kind of differs from mainstream, and I'm pretty sure that I'm right, uh, but you know, you can make your own decision on that. But basically, there's such a thing as an IQ test. And what they do, they test uh, verbal comprehension, they test like visual spatial skills. If you've ever seen or taken an IQ test, they'll have like shapes that, that are being rotated turned and all these different things and you have to like say okay you know here's a pattern of shapes and what it would be the next position of this shape according to this pattern you know visual recognition fluid reasoning um, memory is one of them and then just simply how fast you can do it is another one which is just how fast you can figure things out they'll give you simple little tasks and just see like how fast can you figure this out so I mean IQ tests are, are kind of a, a thing out there. Are they valid? Here's what I would say. Yes and no. I would say that they are valid in the sense that, um, turn to Proverbs chapter 1, and I'll show you from the Bible why I think this. And I, I've also seen this in my life and, and with, with other people as well. But turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Are they valid? I believe that they are valid as a benchmark for a scientific test. I, I do believe that they are valid in that case. But this idea that your IQ is your IQ is just simply false. 
you can increase your IQ. I, I've seen it. I've, I've seen it happen. You can increase your IQ. And by that same logic, you can also decrease your IQ. You see where I'm going with this? All right. Turn to Proverbs chapter five, uh, 1 and look at verse number 5. The Bible also teaches this, by the way. The Bible also see, teaches that you can increase knowledge, you can increase wisdom, or you can decrease it. It's up to you. Look at verse number 5. The, Bi the Bible says this. It says, a wise man will hear and will what? Increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, look at this, verse number 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, meaning that's where it starts, meaning that knowledge in your life can be much increased. Um, but where does it start? It starts with the fear of the Lord. So if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you can't even get off the finish line. This is why you see so many godless people waste their lives looking for aliens or looking for, you know, uh, black holes with dark matter, all this stuff. They just waste their complete lives on these silly things that produce nothing because they didn't start with that fear of the Lord. Right? That's why so many great inventions, so many great things in the Industrial Revolution were, were invented by people. Look, I'm not saying they were saved, but they had the fear of the Lord. But they at least feared God. That's why you see these great things um, throughout history. It was people that feared the Lord. That's the starting line. So the point is, is this is kind of a biblical proof right here that you can increase or decrease your mental ability. All right? And look, I mean, it's true. It's true. I mean, just think about it. Like, there's a lot of chess games that get played here. Okay? And look, I've never claimed to be great at chess, but I remember when we first started playing chess, like, I sat down and played chess, and I did, I did pretty okay amongst, you know, the, I didn't beat everybody, but, I mean, I did pretty good. And then the guys of the church, they just played chess for, like, five months straight. And, like, I just sat and visited with everybody, and I didn't play any chess. And I sat down last week to play chess. I got smoked. I'm looking at Brother Edwin. I'm like, what's happened? I'm like, what is going on? Your knowledge has greatly increased. But look, you can get better at things. You can get better at recognizing patterns and getting strategic and, and linear thinking. These are all things you can get better at. How? By practicing. I don't want to give the sermon away. But you can get better by practicing these things. Your brain is like a muscle. You do nothing but lay on the couch and, and, and eat Cheetos for five years and then try to get up and play football. Everything's going to break. You're going to hurt yourself. You've got to train. All right? But look. Marijuana decreases your ability to think. And I'm going to show you some scary studies, you know, this morning that prove this. Look, a large long longitudinal study in New Zealand found that persistent marijuana use with frequent use starting in adolescence was associated with a loss of, aver of an average of six and up to eight IQ points. So, I mean, at least it's a benchmark. I'm not saying, I mean, it's talking about a delta here. So, I mean, I believe the study because it's talking about somebody who had an IQ at this level. And, I, you know, I'm not saying they can't increase it or decrease it by something they're doing in their life. But what we know is that the delta from using marijuana was it dropped in this study, measured into mid-adulthood. Now, look at this. Those who use marijuana heavily as teenagers and quit as adults. So they used it as teenagers, and when they got over 20 years old, they stopped using marijuana. They did not recover the lost IQ points. It makes you stupid. It makes you dumb permanently. And I'm telling you, I have seen this in my life. I have seen this in my life. So the Bible is clearly teaching you can increase knowledge and wisdom, and the Bible gives advice on how to do that. But you can see here, even from science, that you can decrease it, too. Marijuana decreases your ability to think, is what this study is saying. Permanently. I mean, that's scary. Now, think of this for a second. 76% of doctors approve of medical marijuana use. You're like, what in the world? You know, you're going to get, think of that. You're going to give somebody medication that has permanent cognitive side effects for pain relief? I mean, this is one of the reasons that I don't have much faith in modern medicine. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. The Bible's ahead of the curve on this medical decision, too. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. 
Look at verse number six. This is totally applicable to what's happening with medical marijuana today. Think of it, three quarters of doctors are just like, yeah, you know, you're, you're having a little headache, here you go. Dam give yourself brain damage. That's what we're talking about. Just, just killing off your ability to think. Look at Proverbs 31, verse number six. The Bible says, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Look, this is how marijuana should be used. The Bible is not, you know, you can apply this spiritually, or you can apply this physically. But either way, whether you apply it spiritually or physically, it's not saying give unto him that is going to perish. It's saying give unto him that's ready to perish. Like somebody's just like on their deathbed. Somebody that's like just like ready to just die. Hey, let them. It's like the, the morphine with the soldier on the battlefield. At least make him feel good. He's, he's done. It, that's what the Bible's teaching here. It's saying that is the application for these things that destroy your brain. It's just somebody that is just, they don't have any hope anymore. Is that what's happening? With all these kids? With all these young adults smoking marijuana, they just don't have any hope? Spiritually or physically? No, that's not what's happening at all. Even some middle-aged person that goes to the doctor, oh, I have migraines. Here you go. They're not ready to perish. Let's just get them drunk high and have them damage their, their brains. Now turn back to 2 Kings chapter 9. So the first one is the Bible says, be sober. The second one it applies more applicably to marijuana because of the permanent effects that it leaves on people. Look, and you will notice this with people that even used to smoke marijuana. Tell me that you do not see this. Tell me do they not, do they not talk different? Are they not slower? Are they not like moving in a, it's, it's almost like they're in a different dimension. Some people that have heavily used marijuana in the past, in their lives. It's scary. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. The third point is this, and this is very specific to marijuana as well. The third point is it turns you into a loser. You say, what do you mean by that? I'm going to get specific. Look at 2 Kings chapter 9. We see this, this amazing story in the Bible. So the story, let me just summar, summarize the story of what's happening here for you. There's a lot that happened before this, and there's a lot that's going to happen after this chapter. But basically, you had this wicked king Ahab who came out of this dynasty. He was the third dynasty in the northern kingdom of Israel. And this wicked king Ahab, just God hates him. He wants his whole family gone. He wants Ahab's seed, every male child that is connected to this family, wiped off the face of the earth. That's what God thinks of Ahab. All right? But the problem with Ahab, and the reason it got so serious, is because Jehoshaphat befriended Ahab. And Jehoshaphat was a good king of the lower kingdom of Judah. And what actually happened was, and you wonder, you know, this, there's a lot of sermons that you could do out of 2 Kings chapter 9. But you wonder, like, oh, why shouldn't I have friends that are, um, you know, kind of, I got this one friend, and, you know, I know he's got a lot of problems, but, you know, all this. The danger is for your children. The danger is for the next generation, because Jehoshaphat got right. Jehoshaphat, he got right. He almost died going into battle with Ahab. Like, God spared his life and then sent a prophet to rebuke him. But his son married Ahab's daughter. So when it says, you, there's two kings in 2 Kings chapter 9, who Jehu is hunting down here. Jehu is hunting down Joram, and it's a little confusing because not only did they marry into each other's families, but they named their kids the same names. So there's, there's more than one Ahaziah. There's an Ahaziah on each side, and there's a Joram on each side. But what happens here is Ahaziah is going to visit his uncle, the King Joram of the northern kingdom of Israel. So it's not like they were just buddies. At this point, they're family. And God hires Jehu or tasks Jehu to become king to clean up this mess. And it is a mess that needs to be cleaned up completely. God wants this tie broken between these two kingdoms. He does not want so much for your, our diversity as our strength. No, God wants his people separated. God wants his people separated unto him. He doesn't want them with any ties to this wicked northern kingdom of Israel. And Jehu was picked by Elisha to be the man to take this task home. 
And he does it. And he does it. Now I'm going to show you there's a reason he was chosen for this. Look at 2 Kings chapter 9. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, so Jehu. Now he, he's, he's the king, even though no one knows this. Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. This is the place where Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. This is, his, this is Ahaziah's uncle. He's coming to visit his family, the king of, of Judah and the king of Israel. And there stood a watchman in the tower in Jezreel and spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet him and let him say, Is it peace? So he sees all these riders coming from the tower and he's saying, it, you know, go and see what they want. And so there went on one, hor one on horseback to meet him, verse 18, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. So you have, I mean, you've got to understand the picture here. You've got the guy watching from the tower, and he's watching the messenger go out to Jehu and Jehu's company, Jehu's cavalry or whatever he's bringing with him. And the watchman goes, or the watchman is watching the messenger go, and the messenger, all he sees, he doesn't see the conversation. We only get the conversation from the Bible. He just sees that the messenger goes there and joins him. I mean, basically what Jehu said, he said, what, you know, what is it, peace, get thee behind me. He's saying, get, get with me or I'm going to kill you, is what Jehu was saying. Then went out a second. So now he watches, we better send a second messenger. Something weird happened with that first one. All right. Which came to them and said, thus saith the king, is it peace? And Jehu answered and said, what hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, he came even unto them and cometh not again. So now, they've, now we know it's not a fluke. See, now the watchman looks and say, okay, well, maybe it was a traitorous messenger or whatever. They send another messenger, maybe a more reliable messenger this next time, and he joins Jehu as well. The, me the watchman uh, at the tower is going like, we got a problem here, is what he's thinking about. All right, and this is what he says. He says, and he coming now, he's, he's reporting to the king. He said, the second messenger didn't come back either. And he said, and, he, and the driving, look at this. This is the key right here. He says, and the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi. Why? For he driveth furiously. Notice what he says here. Notice what he says. He says the driving is like Jehu, the son. He's like, I think it's this guy. He doesn't say it's Jehu, and, and Jehu is driving furiously. He says, I know it's him because of how he's driving. He says, I know that it's this man because of the way, what, he's talking about the way he's coming at them, the way he's riding. He's not like, I mean, he is driving furiously. He is coming to accomplish a mission. He was literally identified by this. Meaning what? Meaning that this was Jehu's way. This was how Jehu was identified, how he was riding his horse, because he was like this all the time. He was like this in the things that he did. This is how Jehu drove, always. And this is why God had Elisha anoint him. Because he had this Herculean task in front of him, and he knew he needed someone like Jehu who drove furiously. He wanted it done right. You say, what does it have to do with marijuana? Well, let's go back to our scientific studies here. From Psychology Today, you know how much I love Psychology Today. Here's an article. Does long-term cannabis use stifle motivation? Habitual use of marijuana is linked to lower dopamine levels. What is dopamine? Dopamine is that, 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 that chemical in your brain that, that makes you feel good. Right? You just get done running two miles and like, you just feel really good. After you, you're done running two miles, you just get done exercising and you, know, you feel really good. You know, you, you, it's, it's something that makes you feel good. And this is what drugs and alcohol does, is it gives you that, those false dopamine hits in your head, all right? But the, the study here is showing that researchers have found that levels of dopamine are lower in long-term cannabis smokers and those who began using the drug at a younger age. Lower dopamine in, part of the, in a part of the brain called the striatum is linked to less ambition and motivation. 
So what it's doing is it's giving you these fake dopamine hits, but then it's actually just crushing your ability to even create dopamine in your head. Are things making more sense to you now? You ever met somebody that smokes marijuana? That has smoked marijuana for more than, you know, like one time? That is like a regular user of marijuana? You run into these people and you will know them right away. You don't even have to see them smoking marijuana and meet one of these people and know you use marijuana. Why? It's because of this right here. This is the main reason. There's literally, let me read you this, this another, another one from a UK study. The bio, or not the Bible. This UK study says this. The cannabis users in a study, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Researchers used pet brain imaging. It's this, the way they, they can like scan your brain to look at dopamine production in the striatum of the brain in 19 regular cannabis users and 19 non-users of matching age and matching sex. The cannabis users in the study had all, ex now listen to this too. This is a side note. The cannabis users, 100% of them in the study, had all experienced psychotic-like symptoms while smoking the drug. So the first thing, that's a side note right here. Because everyone thinks that, oh, marijuana just relaxes you. And I've read, I read this statistic in many of the different studies that brought up. Every single person that is a regular user of marijuana experiences psychotic episodes at some point. Every single one. It's like 100%. You say, what is that? It says... It's experiencing strange sensations or having bizarre thoughts, like feeling as though they are being threatened by an unknown force. That's just an example of this study. So all of the marijuana users in this UK study had all experienced this psychotic, 100% of them, at least, you know, occasionally. Okay. The second point is this. So what they were looking for is they thought that they would, ha they would measure higher dopamine levels in the psychotic in the regular cannabis users because psychotic episodes are usually with people that have high dopamine levels, okay, just for your information. Okay, the researchers expected that dopamine production might be higher in this group since increased dopamine production has been linked with psychosis. Instead, they found the opposite effect. It was significantly lower. So it lowers the ability of the brain to produce dopamine, this, this reward center of your brain. There's actually a syndrome out there that you can Google and you can find that it's so common now, there is literally a syndrome describing, you know, what I'm calling as point number three is it makes you a loser. And the syndrome is called a motivational syndrome. You could read for hours and hours and hours on a motivational syndrome. It's so common in our population today among people that smoke marijuana, they've given it a syndrome name. You say, what is the, here's the, here's the, de the definition of a motivational syndrome. Here's what it produces. So the, the scientific reason is that you know, your, your brain loses the ability to produce this dopamine and then you get a motivational syndrome which produces this. Feelings of apathy or emotional numbness, meaning what? You just, what's apathy? It's like you just don't care. Tell me this isn't the marijuana smoker today. They just don't care. They're emotionally numb. Nothing gets them excited. Feeling detached, indifferent, or disinterested, that's kind of the same. Blunted or restricted emotions, that's kind of the same. Look at this one. Lack of motivation to complete tasks or engage in activities. Withdrawal from activities and routines. Routines like, I don't know, getting out of bed at a certain time. Like, I don't know, going to work every day at the same time, at the same place. Trouble focusing and concentrating. I mean, I would relate that back to point number two, where it's just totally like jacking up your brain, just totally just wrecking your brain. Problems with memory and short-term amnesia, which by the way, in people that started out as a teenager and smoked marijuana into their young adult years, they lose this permanently in many of these studies. Imagine just not being able to remember things, not having short-term memory, having damaged short-term memory because of something you did when you were 16 or 17 or 18 years old. Becoming more withdrawn or less active, productive, and social. The problem with, with point number three is it turns you into a loser. What does it mean? It robs your normal desires and your, your normal drive. And it also, as alcohol, it lowers testosterone, men. And lowers testosterone and increases estrogen production. 
You know, I mean, the, this is, you know, it's turning men into women. This, the, look, folks, this is a life killer right here. This amotivational syndrome. This is why Jehu was chosen by Elisha, why he was chosen by God. The importance of drive in your life. Ladies, young ladies, you meet some young man that smokes marijuana, you run like the wind. You run like the wind because that is going to bring you into a life of poverty and destruction. This drive, this motivation is necessary for anyone to have. Folks, look, in order to achieve any goal in your life, you need to have drive. You need to have motivation. I mean, the more, and the more of it you have, the more you will achieve. I don't care if you're talking about spiritual things or regular things. This is why so many people accomplish so much than others this point right here. You wonder, like, oh, you know, you know, I mean, I wonder, I see people that just can't accomplish anything. They can't get anything done. And I wonder, I'm like, don't they look around and see people that are able to accomplish things and think, hey, what's the difference there? It's not because they're taller and they're better looking and, you know, whatever. Or it's not even because they're faster. It's not even because they're smarter. It's because they're more motivated than you are. That is the one thing. It's because they drive like Jehu in whatever they do. That's why people succeed at accomplishing goals that they set for themselves. You're like, well, you know, I just don't have any, I just don't have any drive. Some people don't. Some people don't have drive, but you know what? You know you can get drive? You know you can, you can, ha you can, you can change the way you are and you can get to be a motivated, driven person? Do you know that that's possible? The Bible tells us that that's possible. You say, how can I get drive? I'm not driven in my life. I'm not motivated in my life. I'm not accomplishing any of the goals. See, people that aren't motivated usually have things that they want, goals. They usually have things like, oh, I want to be here. It's just like they're just completely unmotivated and they just float around. They float around until they're 60 and they accomplish nothing. But you can get motivation. You can get drive. The first way is this. Stay away from drugs and alcohol. Because it'll, it'll rob that, especially marijuana, will rob that from you. It'll steal it from you. I was in college my freshman year. I was in college my freshman year, and I remember this specific person. I remember his name. I won't say it now. But he was one of the smartest people in our freshman engineering class. And I remember I transferred schools uh, a year and a half later, two years later. And then I remember going back to visit that school my junior year and I remember seeing him and I do remember him in the dorms I do remember he was a he, he smoked weed and it was kind of surprising to me because nobody really from my small town really it wasn't a thing that was like common like alcohol was common marijuana was not common and I remember this guy and his roommate were into smoking weed and then like I didn't like think he was a bad person or whatever I was just like oh that's strange and I remember I saw him as a junior he, had, he was not in the engineering program anymore and I could not believe what I was looking at he was one of the smartest people in the class, and I saw him, he was just like, yeah, you know, bro, it's like, it's, it's all good, bro. Just be you, bro. It's all, he's like, I'm just like, what, what, what's going on here? Who am I talking to? But that's what it is. It's like, man, you, you, you meet these people at Soul Winning. Let, met this lady, she's watching like six kids, and she's, she is high or used, has been high too much in her life, and she's just like, hey, thanks for coming by. You be you love you. She just like, I mean, it just like, just everything's dulled down. Well, look, it's, it's a life killer. How are you going to be a good mom if that's, if that's your motivation right there? I mean, I walked away, I think I was with Garrett at the time, I walked away just appalled. I'm like, here's these little kids, they're walking around this house, and their mom's just this dulled down, just high, all she cares about is drugs, and she's got no motivation to do anything, much less be a mother. It's pitiful. But look, that can be taken from you permanently. That's the scary thing. You have to have drive. I don't care if you're a man, a woman, a young lady, a young man. You have to have drive in your life or you will fail at everything. So the first thing is stay away from marijuana especially. Stay away from drugs and alcohol. You say, how do I get drive if I don't have any? I've met uh, plenty of nice people that just don't have any motivation, just don't have any drive. But guess what? 
When you get married and you start having kids and then you don't have any motivation, you don't have any drive, I don't think you're a nice person anymore. I think you're a bum. That's what I think. So I was such a nice guy. Yeah, you don't support your family? See what the Bible says about that. See what the Bible says. I don't care how nice you are in a conversation. You're not doing what you're supposed to do when you have those responsibilities. You're not a nice guy. You're a bum. And that's what this marijuana will do to you. It'll give you, I mean, it'll take away your drive. You won't drive furiously in any part of your life. You say, how do I get drive? How do I get drive? Look at Proverbs chapter 16. Look at Proverbs chapter 16. The Bible teaches that you can train your body and your mind. The Bible very clearly teaches that. The Bible says this. Look, the Bible here is teaching in Proverbs chapter 16, in verse number 3, the Bible is teaching that you can use head knowledge to become driven. Look at, the, look at the Bible. It says, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Now, look, we've got we to look at this, some, some timeline here. Your thoughts are not established at this point. You're not driven. You're not motivated. What does the Bible say you should do? Commit your works. The Bible says, you know, it, look, it's perfect example with your spiritual life, but it works for every other part of your life. You say, I don't know how to be a hard worker. I don't feel like working hard. I get up in the morning, and I just want to continue laying there. It's, the Bible here is saying, is like, no, you need to commit your works. You know you're supposed to go and work hard, so you have to do it anyway. You have to force your body to do it, even if you don't feel like doing it. If you're driven by your feelings, you are going to fail in everything in your life. You have to commit your works before your heart is in it. That's, I mean, think about just an example of, of working out. Look, when you're out of shape and you're overweight, you don't want to work out. And all you do is eat junk food. You look, you got to set a goal and then work out four times a week. And you're like, well, I feel sick when I do it. You just need to keep doing it over and over and over again. And then guess what? Then it will start to feel good. Then your heart will be committed to it, but you have to force the work at the beginning. That's how everything works. That's how you become driven. Tell me the Bible will not make you successful. The Bible is saying commit your works first. I know you're lazy, the Bible is saying. I know you're a bum and you're fat and you don't want to do anything, but go and do it anyway, and then your heart and your thoughts will catch up behind you. Amen. And then pretty soon, you're not going to want to eat the junk food, and it's not going to taste good to you, and you're going to just want to go out and you want to, you're like, i got to do this. And you're going to start doing it five times a week. This is what will happen. But you have to commit the works first. The Bible is saying, just do it, and the heart will follow. I mean, all you really need, folks, is that beginning desire to get motivated. And then just follow this path. Stay away from the drug that will destroy everything. Trust yourself, and your thoughts will follow. Marijuana is a non-starter. It'll literally make you not get off the finish line because it, it robs the desire from you. I mean, 99%, think of this one. Think of the spiritual application. 99% of the people in this world should be concerned that they're not saved. They should be concerned that if their next heartbeat doesn't come, they're going to end up in hell. But they're not. This is the problem today, is we care more about people's salvation than they do. Well, this is what marijuana will do to your entire life on this earth. Marijuana is totally a tool of Satan, big time. Now, it's an especially good one. Every area of your life you should be driving furiously. Every area. I mean, at work, at work you should drive furiously at work. You should go to work and you should drive furiously. And you know what? You go to work and you drive furiously, especially in this day and age, you're going to make people mad. You can't care about that. You can't care about that. Because the people that do matter will like that you drive furiously. The Elishas and God himself will like it. Look, the critics don't like those that strive valiantly. They don't like those people. But the critics don't matter. The critics are not who matters. The people that do matter, 
they will like that you drive furiously. All the goals, I mean, you think of young men and young women. Young men, you want to get married, you have to drive towards that goal furiously. You have to understand, you can't just go flopping around in life and think that you're going to get somewhere. If you're married, you should be pursuing your wife furiously. If you're a wife, you should be pursuing your husband furiously. You should be just studying, how can I be a good wife? How can I be a good husband? How can I do this better? The answers there are in the Bible, but once you know the answers, drive furiously. Everything is, is depending on how hard you drive towards these goals. And look, turn to Psalm chapter 63, and, and we'll land the plane here. But your spiritual life, you should pursue it furiously. Your spiritual life should be pursued Furiously, look at Psalm chapter 63. You know, there's a trend. I like trends. There is a definite trend to some young man that can't get his life together to him being successful in the Christian life. I have never seen a young man, and I mean, I'm being biased because I'm more, you know, I'm a man, but I've never seen a young man who can't hold the job and can't get you know, things right in his life and then just be totally successful in his spiritual life. I've never seen it. The spiritual life always follows that same trend. Why? Because they don't drive furiously at one thing, so they're not going to drive furiously at the most important thing. It just, it just doesn't happen. And that's why you see that trend. I mean, there's a definite, people that can't hold a job succeed at tasks. They just, they, they fall out of the Christian life. They may make it a year, Maybe two years, but eventually, this is a killer for their Christian life. Look at Psalm chapter 63. How should I pursue, how should I pursue my Christian life? Look at verse number 8. Look at, look at what the psalmist says here. He says, my soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. That is how we are supposed to follow the Lord. That is supposed to be the drive that we not only have you know, in our lives, but especially in our Christian lives. And guess what? And guess what? If you're like, you know what? I don't know how to follow hard in my Christian life. Why don't you just do it? Why don't you just never miss a church service? Why don't you start reading your Bible every single day? Why don't you start putting some si time aside in your life to have a prayer life every single day? Why don't you actually just start doing the works and see if the Bible's true? And see if the, the, the thoughts and the heart follows those things. But people will never commit the works. Because they don't have the motivation for it. But the Bible is saying, fall hard after the Lord. Drive furiously after the Lord. Look, I should preach furiously. That's why, you know, you get up here and you preach and you see people wreck their life. It makes me angry. It makes me upset. Because the word of God is being told to you. You have no excuse. You know, just commit the works. Look, I've seen that work so many times I can't count. Where people are like, man, I'm just... Not, I'm just like, just do it. Just do it. And then they do it, and pretty soon they love it. Pretty soon, like, this is what my life is supposed to be like. It's true joy comes from it. Even when you're being persecuted, you could experience joy in this Christian life. It's the weirdest thing, but it's true. The Bible says follow hard after these things. And guess what? You know what? Maybe if you figure out how to follow hard in one area of your life, Maybe that'll spill over into the things that don't matter as much. Maybe that'll spill over into other areas of your life. Maybe it'll spill over into your marriage. Maybe it'll, I don't know, maybe it'll rub off on your kids. You're like, I mean, these people are just like, just going to be a bum, and then you think, I'm just going to raise awesome kids. Like, what in the world? You're going to raise a bunch of bums if you don't have any motivation in your life. Marijuana is not harmless. It robs, this, it robs the, the desire to follow anything hard. It is super serious. And if you've ever met somebody, like I said, young ladies, you find somebody or a group of people that is into smoking marijuana, you get out of there. That is, a, that is a life sentence for you. If you marry into that, as Jehoshaphat's kids married into that, it was a life sentence. I mean, he killed both kings here. He killed Ahaziah and Joram. It is not possible to drive hard at anything when you are doing this to yourself. 
So once again, folks, I, I hate to break it to you this morning, but the, the narrative out there is not true. The mainstream narrative on this is, is not a, a true one. If you fall or if you follow this narrative in this area in your life, you will fail in all areas. It is not harmless. It is not, I mean, it is not something that you can use, you know, without consequence because it's natural. Why don't you just go eat a bunch of poisonous mushrooms? It's ridiculous. That you know, the whole, the thought process on that. And the idea that it's medicine is insane. You know, why don't you just go, you know, you're, you have a headache, why don't you just go huff a bunch of gasoline and, and pass out and then you won't have a headache anymore. I mean, what, what's next? What's next? I mean, they, are they teaching this in medical school? They're probably all high in medical school. It's extremely dangerous poison. It'll wreck your spiritual life. I mean, it'll get you thrown out of church. Think about that. It'll wreck your spiritual life. You know, it'll take away all your motivation. It'll make you stupid. And the Bible says be sober. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.